In Philippians, we are asking the question, what should the church look like? Through the lens of Philippians, a very significant and powerful letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church. And as we've been walking our way through this, as you know, this is my tendency, this series is just growing and it's getting longer and longer. What I thought was 10 weeks will be 12. What I thought was 12 will probably be 16. As we just continue to walk through this magnificent letter that Paul has given us, it is so full. I find myself every week, as we'll take a particular paragraph, I find myself every week thinking, I really need three weeks in this paragraph. I really believe that I could preach Philippians on Sunday morning for 52 Sundays in the year and still not exhaust it in its depth. I hope that you're finding it that way as we're walking together. We begin our reading in verse 12, chapter 2 of Philippians. My reading is from the ESV, so if it, if it varies slightly with yours, that will explain it. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial giving of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul was a prisoner of an empire both glorious and terrible. He faced the very real possibility of a failed defense, followed by a very sudden execution. Rome, feasting on glory and power and pleasure, was not the least bit squeamish in the disposal of criminals and critics and agitators Yet even under this threat, Paul writes to the Philippians with optimism, with joy, not with a sense of resignation, but peace and sovereignty. Paul understood so well that his days could be numbered, that his days were numbered. He knew this. He said, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with you. Poured out like a drink offering. The priests, of, the priests of Israel would pour out a drink offering on the greater sacrifices. And so Paul, in a spirit of humility, looks at his whole life as though it's the drink offering that's poured over what they are doing. You get this idea that Paul does not elevate himself above people, but he rather, according to the spirit of Philippians, he humbles himself. And he says, I am being poured out. Even if now I am being poured out as this drink offering, I rejoice. Paul is absolutely convinced that he will not die of a natural cause. And this is the lens we must look through as we read Philippians especially. As Paul is under threat, not for the first or the last time in his life, but Paul is under threat of death, he writes this letter. We've got to bear that in mind or we're going to misread the letter. It's only as we see through this lens that we can rightly answer the question, how then should we live? How then should we live? You see, Paul saw himself as Christ's servant. And in his life, he sees himself as God's property. His worldview, facing desperate times, should be ours by adoption. For we too face desperate times. We live in a similar age. We live in glorious and terrible times. How then should we live as we strive amidst a depraved generation? I use the language of Paul, a depraved generation. Malcolm Muggeridge captured our times so very well, the late Malcolm Muggeridge, I should say. 
He said, and it's brilliant, listen. The world's way of responding to the signs of decay is to engage equally in idiot hopes and idiot despair. On the one hand, some new policy or discovery is confidently expected to put everything to rights, a new fuel, a new drug to taunt world government. On the other hand, some disaster is confidently expected to prove our undoing. Capitalism will break down, fuel will run out, plutonium will lay us low, atomic waste will kill us off, overpopulation will suffocate us, or alternatively, a declining birth rate will put us more surely at the mercy of our enemies. In Christian terms, such hopes and fears are equally beside the point. As Christians, we know that in this world we have no continuing city, that crowns roll in the dust, and that every earthly kingdom must sometime flounder. We acknowledge a king men did not crown and cannot dethrone, and we are citizens of a city of God they did not build and cannot destroy. Muggeridge taps into this idea that we are citizens of another realm. He gets this directly from Paul and, of course, from Peter also. We live as a saved people in a dying world that cannot be saved. People can be saved. The world cannot. This world, the Scripture says quite clearly, is passing away. The only thing that will endure is the soul that is born again. Come into relationship with Jesus Christ, who by his very nature and title Savior, brings them to that place of release where they are not under any longer the curse of death under which this entire system operates. We live as a saved people in a world that is perishing, and it is a mad, mad world. A man deeply depressed flies a plane full of strangers into a mountainside. Deranged Islamists fly planes into office towers. It is a steady stream of bombs and bullets and beheadings and atrocity. Morality that is today stretched to embrace everything has now come to mean absolutely nothing. Choosing to deny God, we adopt the reprobate mind. Read what Paul says in Romans. Given over to a reprobate mind. We have never been so well educated and so utterly lacking in wisdom. We have never been so utterly lost for answers, for poverty, answers for war, answers for hatred, answers for greed. We are awash in experts and specialists. One is bailing us out while the other is drilling a hole in the bottom of the boat. You'll find them on NBC, and they've got one solution. You'll find them on Fox News, and they've got another solution. And then every once in a while, every once in a while, they both agree, and they're both wrong. They're experts, and they're highly educated. Malcolm Muggeridge was right when he later said in life, we have educated ourselves into imbecility. We have educated ourselves into imbecility. Steve Turner, the General Secretary for the British Association of Journalists, wrote a poem in 2003. I grabbed it. I had to grab it. It was just too good. It's become known as Turner's Creed. It's a parody. He wrote this parody on the pseudo-wisdom of our age. Not a Christian man, but he wrote of the pseudo-wisdom of the age. And as in all good parody, truth peeks out from under the covers. Here's Turner's Creed. We believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin. We believe everything is okay as long as it doesn't hurt anyone to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your knowledge. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe that adultery is fun. We believe that sodomy is okay. We believe that taboos are taboo. We believe in every, that everything is getting better despite evidence to the contrary, so the evidence must be investigated. You can prove anything with evidence. If you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. We believe that there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. Jesus was a good man, just like Buddha, Muhammad, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think his good morals were, were bad. 
We believe that all religions are basically the same. We all believe in love and goodness. They only differ in matters of creation, sin, heaven, hell, God, and salvation. We believe that after death comes the nothing, because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. If death is not the end, if, death, if, death, if the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for us all, except perhaps Hitler, Stalin, and Genghis Khan. We believe in Masters and Johnson. What's selected is average, what average is normal, what's normal is good. We believe in total disarmament. We believe that there are direct links between warfare and bloodshed. Americans should beat their guns into tractors and the Russians, the Russians will surely follow. We believe that man is essentially good. It's only his behavior that lets him down. I love that. I love that. <laughs> I love the fall down laughing right there. This is, by the way, this is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions. Conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him. Reality will adapt accordingly. The universe will readjust. History will alter. We believe that there is no absolute truth except the truth that there is no absolute truth. We believe in the rejection of creeds, and he caps it with this. If chance is the father of all flesh, disaster is his rainbow in the sky. And when you hear state of emergency, sniper kills, can, uh, kills 10, troops on rampage, youth go looting, bomb blast at school, it is but the sound of man worshiping his maker. Steve Turner's done little more here than assemble yesterday's headlines. We live in a world gone mad, a world that hopes in saving itself, although no one pretends to know how. Lyman Abbott captured the spirit of our age, a prayer in today's culture. Our brethren who are upon the earth, hallowed be our name. Our kingdom come, our will be done on earth, for there is no heaven. We must go get our daily bread. We neither forgive nor are forgiven, for nature knows no forgiveness. We fear no temptation. We deliver ourselves from evil. And ours is the kingdom and ours is the power, for there is no glory and no forever. You say, well, you sound like you're a nihilist this morning, that you, you've just been absorbing all of this negativity. No, I've been watching the news. And I've been questioning myself as to whether my attitudes are shaped by a mad world or the Word of God, whether my attitudes are being shaped by what I see going on around me or by what I know to be truth revealed in the heart whether I am trusting in our own ability to fix our problems or whether I have knelt before the living God saying, I am trusting in you and in you alone. I'm asking myself these questions. You see, there is a kingdom and there is power and there is glory and there is a forever and there is hope and there is a salvation that is great and it's sure. And this is what Paul is writing about. He wrote correctly to the Corinthians, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's foolishness to the world, but we live out of step with the world. Or at least we should. If you'll remember a few weeks ago, I pointed out Paul's play on words as he's reminding the Philippians that they are not of this world. They are aliens here. They are colonists of the kingdom of heaven in the earth, as surely as they were colonists of Rome in Philippi, in Macedonia. He said, you are colonists from heaven here in the earth. How then should they live? Let's address it in a fresh way from the text this morning. First, we live as recipients of salvation. As recipients of salvation, therefore, we live as saved people. We have received, now we live it out. And this is the major disconnect in modern Christianity. Many have come to our churches who have accepted Christ, received Christ, but there is no living out that decision that they have made. You see, the prerogative is all there. I accept, I receive, I decide. 
The language alone carries absolutely nothing. If a man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me. It, it completely denies this whole idea that my life is now his. Not just my life is some a vision of, of, of who I am, but my life as it is lived out practically each and every day. This is the challenge of the age. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2, we read it in our text, verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in. Note, work out. God works in. God works in, you work out. Do you understand what the Scripture is saying here? What God has put within you is not just for you. It is to be worked out of you to will and to do, not your own will, but to will and to do His good pleasure. His good pleasure. We have to move beyond the written Word to be the living Word. We've got folks who know their Bibles well. But their lives would never, they would never even hint that they are people of the Word because it is never lived out. They're not working out their salvation. They're not living out their salvation. They simply say, I, I've got it. I have it. And that's all that matters. That, that is so indicative of our culture today where the bottom line is this. Whatever pleases me, Whatever makes me happy, whatever fulfills me, that's what really matters in life. And nothing could be further from the truth. So we have to do more than read the Bible. We have to do more than believe the Bible. We have to live the Bible. And people divorce these things. They say, the, the fact that I believe that's going to get me to heaven and everything else does not matter. And you cannot divorce those things. You can't carve them up. We dichotomize, we trichotomize, we, we carve it all up and we set certain things aside and we say, this is what matters because I read these six scriptures together in, in, uh, in succession in Romans and that I went the Romans road so it's all done and we turn our eyes away from volumes of scripture that say how you live matters and it cannot be divorced from faith. There is no divorcing faith from works or works from faith. There is no divorce. You cannot pull them apart and somehow say, this is what's going to get me to heaven and this is secondary. That is Christian Gnosticism. We have pulled the very problems that Paul was combating in the first century into our century where we have divided our activity from what we say we believe. The Gnostics, you see, the Gnostics said they had special knowledge of God and their special knowledge of God is what mattered. The flesh didn't matter at all, so indulge the flesh. Do whatever you want with your body. Do whatever you want with your activity because salvation was purely a state of mind. We have a modern Gnosticism that has taken grip within our churches and not just within Calvinism where this thrives. In Calvinism, in Arminianism, in Reformed theology, we find it in almost every school of theology, this idea that faith and works are dichotomized. They're cut apart. And you simply cannot do that. On the 1st of August, 1981, Sherry and David got married. It was the making of a covenant. It was an event. It was a production. The day began, we were engaged. The day finished, and we were married. And you'd laugh me off the platform this morning if I were to boast that in that moment we were instantly compatible, we were deeply mature, we were fully adjusted, we were emotionally settled. We were a shining example on that day of what a marriage should be or could be. We were experts at living the married life. Would you laugh at me if I were to make that claim? The truth is that we were two dumb kids... We had been married for about 20 minutes or in about 20 minutes on a summer afternoon. And after that, we just had to learn how to live it out, how to work it out. We are still learning how to work it out. She has a far greater challenge than I. She's easy to live with. Me, not so much. 
See, Paul's not saying that we each work out our own terms of salvation. That's where people misread this text all the time. Well, we've just got to work out our own salvation. What people do with that text by pulling it out of its context, its context, by the way, is obedience. Read the whole second chapter. The context of the entire second chapter is obedience to the Word of God. But we pull it out of context and say, well, everyone just needs to work out their own salvation. Can't we all just get along? I think that all roads ultimately lead to God. This is an absolute twisting of the Scripture. Paul is not saying that we each work out salvation on our own terms or that we each define our own salvation in our own way. By work out our own salvation, Paul is talking about moving into relationship, not merely living by contract or covenant. He's talking of living out the covenant. A covenant that is not lived out is worthless. Am I correct? If you have a treaty that is signed between two countries and they have absolutely no desire whatsoever to fulfill any of the conditions of the treaty, what's the treaty worth? I fear that we're doing that this very day with Iran. No, no desire whatsoever to fulfill terms of any kind of covenant. The reason that we are in the awful fix we are today is that men do not keep covenant. They don't work out the, the, the contract. They don't work out the covenant. They don't work out even those treaties that could be salvific. We are to live out the covenant we've made. And this is, by the way, this is utterly impossible by our own strength. We are no better than the Pharisees who disciplined themselves to a very strict obedience of the law, and yet they failed utterly to capture the spirit of it. The most righteous, clean, living people in Israel Jesus reserved his harshest criticism for. Because while they were crossing all of their T's and dotting all of their I's, their hearts were dead. Christianity that's not lived out is worthless. Utterly worthless. It's so impossible in our own strength. Paul says, work out your own salvation. This is a futile suggestion, except for the rest of the sentence. The rest of the sentence says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good work. This is very important. This is so very important because it says that we are to work out as he works in. Paul's whole point is that we must cooperate with the work of God in our lives. And as we cooperate with the work of the Spirit in our lives, that is, by the way, what Paul calls walking in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But if we do not cooperate with God, if we don't cooperate with God, then it's a moot point. The key is found in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Obedience to the Word of God as we walk and live is the process of living out, working out this salvation. And you can't carve any piece of this off and stand it to the side and say, this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. It's a continuum. It's a life. If you don't work it out, what's the point? You see, beginning and becoming are two concepts carried in the idea of salvation. We focus almost exclusively on beginning to the neglect of becoming. There is not a church movement out there today that are not wringing their hands saying, how can we get our arms around discipleship? Getting people to make a decision, that's pretty easy. But getting people to become disciples of Jesus, that is a major, major hill. And we're struggling to climb it. It really comes down to this. We have separated beginning from becoming. 
Think of the artist who spends the morning setting up his easel. He positions the canvas on, on the easel. He adjusts the lighting so it's just perfect. He sets out all of his brushes and his thinner and his paints. He gets everything rolled into place and his stool in place. Then he goes out to lunch. And he never paints a stroke. Our churches include large populations who have begun, but they have not become. And what they do is they live at that point of beginning, and every few weeks they get convicted because they don't see spiritual progress in their life, so they run down to an altar and they make a new beginning, but fail completely to become anything. And so they live beginning, 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 but they never, never make any spiritual progress. It's like John Maxwell said of the executive who boasted as he was being considered for a position as he's been interviewed, he said, I have 20 years experience. And the guys who were assessing him ultimately said, no, from what we can tell, you have one year of experience repeated 20 times. You run into people like that, they've just been around for a long, long time, but they've never grown beyond step one. This is the scourge of the church. We set up our easel, and we may even draw a few pencil lines of the Christian life, but we never actually paint. We never actually become the masterpiece God has designed us to be. We never become that depiction whereby people can look at us and see the face of Jesus. And this is what Paul challenges the Philippians with. Work it out, boys, he says, and girls. Work it out. We think of salvation as a point-in-time experience rather than a continuum. Let me illustrate it another way. <laughs> Subscribing to Backpacker Magazine does not make me a backpacker. Mastering the content of Backpacker Magazine does not make me a backpacker. Attending symposiums on the art of backpacking or packpacking because we parse everything forward and backward does not make me a backpacker. Owning a Kelty backpack, a white gas stove, a sleeping bag that is good to 100,000 degrees below zero, having food in bags that taste like cardboard and cost about $900 a serving, having boots that cost as much as my car, does not make me a backpacker. Going on dream trips for $50 a day, planning it all, planning does not make me a backpacker. There is only one thing that will make me a backpacker, and that is that I put the pack on my back and walk into the wilderness. And when I am walking into the wilderness, I am backpacking. Hence, I am a backpacker. And if you are going to be a Christian, you've got to decide you're going to strap on your pack and you're going to walk into the wilderness. Other words, otherwise, you are an expert. You are an absolute expert, possibly, on nothing at all. And the kingdom of God is not beginning to be advanced through you. I might read Sailing World, but this does not make me a sailor. I might know the dimensions of the 12-meter racing yacht. I may understand the costs involved, the number of crew required for every size boat. I may understand how these incredible fibers are wove together to create a shell that is so very light that it can almost sail out of the water rather than in the water. I might know it backwards and forwards, but if I never leave the land and see the wind in the sails, I'm not a sailor. Runner's world. Huh. Do you know how many people get runner's world and never run a step? 
but they feel good about getting runner's world. And they read all the articles and they plan one day to be a runner. You are not a runner because you have subscribed to runner's world. You are a runner when you lace up your shoes and run. Becoming occurs when we have moved beyond beginning. Becoming occurs when we have moved beyond beginning. He who began a good work in you, you don't, Paul doesn't stop there. It's Philippians 1 6, isn't it? Paul doesn't stop there. Hey, I just wanted to tell you today, he who began a good work in you, you say it's nonsensical. You haven't finished the sentence. Most of us haven't finished the sentence. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. You want to talk about salvation? If you're talking about it as a point in time, you are completely missing the boat. Salvation is that point in time in a continuum that leads you to the day of Christ. That's what we are called to. He who began a good work and you will be faithful to complete it. He'll be faithful to complete it. What is our part? Paul makes it very, very clear that we have a part in all of this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, with reverent awe. Why awe? And this is a whole different plat. This is a whole other message. This is a whole other day, but we've got to touch on it for a moment. Why should we have reverence and awe? Paul makes it very clear in the context here. He says, because God is actually engaged in a transformational work within you. The God of the universe is at work within you. The God of the universe has a plan for your life that he is actively working out where you will cooperate with him. And when you cooperate with him in the working out of this plan, what does he do? <laughs> he makes us more and more like his son, Jesus. And when the world looks at us, they see his face shining through. This is scriptural. You see, God's transformational work within you transforms what comes out of you. So we need to live as saved people. We need to shine as lights in this dark world. As we continue in the text, that's why Paul says, do all things. It's a therefore. It's a continuum. Here's how you live that life out. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Most people do not have this text highlighted in their Bibles. Do all things. What's, your, what's the text of your life? Well, do all things without grumbling or disputing. No. Grumbling and disputing, these things are considered to be inalienable rights. We have the right to complain about our job. We have the right to gripe and whine and complain about politics. Even be unchristian in our politics. We have the right to stand up for our rights. We find ourselves often the grumpiest people in America. And the world cannot see Jesus in us for the mask that we're wearing. Which is why the scripture says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. Do not send me a complaint about this message this week. Don't do it. Simply will not read them. You got to sign them for me to read them. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. So if you're grumbling and complaining, you can't be blameless and innocent because your spirit's wrong. So get your spirit right. Do all without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of crooked and twisted generation. So understand Paul's logic. If you live your life grumbling and complaining, you don't look any different than this twisted and depraved generation. So they don't know what you're about anyway. You look just like them. Right? 
So do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast the word of life. It's about more than a personal salvation. It's about more than a private integrity with God. We are saved for something far greater than ourselves. And we need to stop and think about that. We're saved for something far greater than ourselves. When we fail to take notice of God's guiding hand, His sovereign prerogative, His purposes in our creation, we, rather than giving praise and thanksgiving, often do the opposite. We grumble. We complain. We become known for something other than love. We become our own worst enemy. We fail to stand out. We fail to shine against the darkness, for we choose darkness and envy and strife and anger and hatred and prejudice and greed and racism and arrogance and hypocrisy and deceit and bitterness. We are dirty and blemished, crooked and twisted. These are the attributes of the fallen age that Paul says our, li our lives should stand in stark contrast to. This is the very background that we are supposed to shine against, but we have faded into the background. We at times resemble dwarf stars who only offer a glimmering evidence that they were once bright and brilliant. Lost unless somebody finds them. We're called to clean hearts and unblemished motives and straight paths and biblical integrity. Paul's words make it clear that in order to shine against the darkness, our lives need to be governed by different properties altogether. Darkness cannot shine. It takes light to shine. And that light is not our own. It is God working within us as we work out his purposes. Needing to tie this up someplace, the Sermon on the Mount emerges in my thinking. Because lest we think Paul is riffing on a theme here and getting off on his own thing or speaking only to, Philipp to a Philippian issue, and unless we submerge all of this in a culture and a context and say, well, that really doesn't apply to us today, we need to go back to the seminal teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 where he said, you are, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand where it gives light to all of the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works. The good working out of your faith, that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Paul speaks of this shining light in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. And rather than just grab a verse, you have to catch the paragraph in its context. It is so powerful. Now, read it against what we've been speaking of this morning. Paul says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, for we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
And lest, lest we miss it, Paul switches metaphors. And he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the glory is not ours, but his. We have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It will only be seen in this world as our salvation is lived. We've got to move beyond beginning to becoming. People living out, working out their salvation with reverent awe. People who stay amazed at the fact that it is God at work within them both to will and to do his good pleasure. Are you becoming? Are you settled? Do you have your spirituality, your Christianity, your salvation? Is it sitting up on the mantelpiece? Is there a little monument there that says, on such and such a day I gave my heart to Jesus and this means I'm a Christian. Here it is. Some of us wear it in a cross around our necks. Or we declare it as part of our life history. I was married on December the 1st. 1981, I was saved. September the 23rd in 1976. Moments in time that were really only moments of beginning. I worked when I was a young man on a bridge construction crew during the summers in the state of Iowa. I worked with a guy named Jimmy who attended my dad's church. Jimmy was, uh, he was a piece of work. He would arrive at work and he would just start talking. That's all he ever, he just talk, 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 talk. He was upset about everybody and everything at all times. Boss called him Jimmy Cricket because he was always just crick, 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 crick. Jimmy would ride to work with me one week and I would ride to him with him the next and for two summers I got Jimmy and I would try and get beyond Jimmy's defenses to talk to him about the fact that his profession of faith on Sunday morning and he looked good on Sunday morning he was one of the greeters he was out at the door he had the suit on man he looked sharp he knew everyone he was such a polite man on Sunday. You would never imagine that profanity would ever come out of his mouth. I heard him curse the wallpaper off the walls the other six days of the week, but you would never imagine that Jimmy was anything but solid, upstanding citizen. And so any chance that I got to engage him in a conversation that would even begin to explore these matters, well, I'd look for the moment. And immediately upon going there, Jimmy would validate his credentials. He would tell me about the day he got saved. And he would also tell me about the day at the Dick Eastman meeting where he was slain in the spirit and had a remarkable experience with God. And he would rehearse those two events because there was nothing else. For two years, I tried to help him see that there had to be something beyond that. But Jimmy Cricket wasn't going to hear anything from a 20-year-old kid with a year of school theology under his belt. And his life never made sense. Does yours? Does yours? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus 
that you would help us to understand how awesome, how wonderful and terrible it is. The God of all creation would come to live in us and work through us. And that having been fully identified with him, we might put on masks and try and live a camouflage life, fitting into a dark world rather than shining as lights. Could there be a greater sin than to squander the gift of God so freely given? I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you would convict us of how we live of those hypocrisies we have deemed respectable, manageable, defensible. I pray, Lord, today that you would bring us to a place of surrender, that the Christ life might become possible. And the facade that we've been wearing, that it might crumble that the glory of God might be seen in us. So help us.